welcome back everyone. So, first talk is by Ankit and he will tell us about analyzing alternating minimization. Thanks Shubangi. This on, okay. Uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me and uh, thanks everyone for coming to the talk. So, uh, yeah, I'll be talking about analyzing these alternating minimization algorithms or we call them scaling algorithms using algebraic methods. This is based on joint work with a bunch of people and many of them are in the audience. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so alternating minimization is a widely used heuristic uh, in machine learning and optimization and there are very few guarantees for uh, when this algorithm converges to the optimal solution. And there are even fewer guarantees uh, when it converges to the optim optimal solution in a polynomial number of iterations. Okay? And in this talk, <coughs> we'll see that in the setting of group actions, uh, we can prove efficient convergence guarantees. And for this, we'll use tools from invariant theory and representation theory. Okay, okay so yeah, so we saw this example. So yeah, this is the first example. We saw this example in Avi's talk. Uh, a is a non-negative matrix and you want to scale A. So what this means is that you want to multiply each row by some number, multiply each column by some number, and you want that the resulting matrix is doubly stochastic, okay? All the row and column sums are one. So that's the problem, okay? Matrix scaling. And then uh, we have this uh, Sinkons algorithm that uses two simple primitives. Uh, we have row normalization. Basically, you multiply each row of A by the inverse of the row sum, okay? So that's row normalization. You just multiply ith row by ri inverse, and then there's a co corresponding column normalization where you multiply A by the inverse of the column sums, okay? Right, so the ith column is multiplied by ci inverse, okay? And so you can notice that uh, row normalization makes the row sums one, and column normalization makes the column sums one, but they don't go well with each other. When you do column normalization, you might destroy the rows and so on, okay? But yeah, Syncon suggested this algorithm that you just alternately try to fix rows and columns. Okay. So that's Syncon's algorithm. Actually, yeah, this is not proposed by Syncon. Someone else before Syncon, but Syncon uh, proved that this algorithm converges to, the, uh, to something doubly stochastic. So yeah, so there's this theorem from Syncon and Knopp in 1967 that says that this algorithm converges whenever it should. Okay. So it should only converge when the permanent is greater than zero. So we saw this in Avi's talk, and it converges whenever it should. Okay. So that, that was theorem of Syncon and Knopp. So Syncon in 1964 proved a weaker theorem that the algorithm converges whenever all the entries are positive. Okay. But you don't need that. So that was rectified in this uh, follow-up. Okay. Yeah. But they don't don't didn't provide any efficient guarantees for convergence. Yeah, I mean, that's probably because maybe they didn't care about it. <coughs> so, uh, but yeah, so the efficient guarantees were provided in this paper of Lineal Semerodinsky and Vigderson in 2000. They proved that in n log n over epsilon iterations, roughly, so b is the bit complexity, okay? So n t times b plus log n over epsilon iterations, you get epsilon close to doubly stochastic. So I if if you have a doubly stochastic scaling, you run this algorithm in n times b plus log n over epsilon iterations, you'll get, get epsilon close to doubly stochastic. And what this means is a precise technical sense, like the L2 norm of the row and column sums vector from the all ones vector is epsilon. Okay, that's what it means. Okay. okay, any questions so far? Yeah, so they use permanent as a potential function for the analysis of their algorithm. And the reason, uh, yeah, the question is why? Why do they use the permanent? And this, so, so there are two reasons for this. One is that the algorithm evolves according to a series of group actions, right? Sort of you're applying a group action, multiplying it by a uh, diagonal matrix on the left and the right. So algorithm evolves according to a series of group actions. Okay, that's one reason why you use permanent. And the other reason is that permanent is invariant with respect to this group action. Okay. So permanent is invariant with respect to this group action. So yeah, I, I write invariant in this quotes because it's not exactly invariant, it's invariant up to a scalar. Okay. 
So what do I mean? So if you have permanent of d1 a d2, then it's equal to the determinant of d1 times permanent of a times determinant of d2 times permanent of a. Uh, where d1 and d2 are diagonal matrices. <coughs> so it's very easy to track the progress of permanent as the algorithm evolves because it just changes by a scalar every step. You just have to uh, change the scalar uh, to keep track of the scalar. OK, any questions so far? Yes. Is that the same for Hamiltonian cycles, though, if you replace that? Hamiltonian cycles? Yeah, if you if you not look at permanent, a variation of the Hamiltonian cycle. It would be the same, yeah. In fact, yeah. you'll see why it's same. Okay. Well, I don't know if that because the monomials are the, I mean, the permutations are so any. Yeah. Fun, any yeah. So all the products of the perm, yeah, the, those are also. Yeah. But yeah, it doesn't matter. You can use a permanent. Yeah. So permanent is invariant. Okay. Yeah. So that's why they use the permanent as a potential function, and in this talk we'll see that this generalizes to other settings as well. Okay. And let's see other settings. OK. So one other setting is this uh, setting of operator scaling, which also Avi mentioned briefly. OK. Yes. So if you write the permanent instead of the determinant, it's also correct. Why is it more natural to write the determinant? You'll soon see. D1, D2, why is it sure? Yeah, for determinant also, it's correct. Just it will generalize. Later, it will not be diagonal matrices. It will yeah, be so some, matrices. So permanent, yeah. So sort of you have this property that permanent will start greater than zero whenever uh, you are scalable. But sometimes the determinant could be zero. <coughs> like for example, the determinant of the all ones matrix is zero. That's something you don't want. You want that your sort of convergence is characterized by non-zeroness of the uh, he potential was function. About the other he was asking, about, was asking okay. about the two, the determinants of D1 and D2. It comes from the group somehow? Yeah. yeah. Why we put the permanent of D1? Oh, I see. This you were saying. <coughs> this, why can't I write permanent? I mean, yeah, just the sh short notation. You can write product of the entry. It doesn't matter. No, no, he meant, yeah, <laughs> write the determinant as opposed to permanent for D1. This? Yeah. It's the same. Yeah, but later the terminant will be the one to, yeah. It's the terminant. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. No, no. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so one of the setting is this operator scaling. In this, you have M inputs, so M matrices. Now they are not non negative, they have complex entries. And you want them to satisfy these two conditions, okay? So you want that sum over i, ai, ai conjugate transposes identity, and also sum over i, ai conjugate ai, ai conjugate transpose ai is identity. Okay? So you want these two conditions, and the operations that you're allowed are the left red action. Okay? So you can pick invertible matrices B and C, and pre, post, pre and post multiply them simultaneously on the AIs. Okay? So those are the operations. So why, like what is this? And, so this turns out of the gradient equals zero condition for this norm square minimization for this corresponding group action. Right? So this is something uh, Avi briefly mentioned in his talk. So in general, we are studying this norm square minimization problem. And the gradient equals zero condition it, uh, turns out to be capturing these two conditions. Okay? And sort of, yeah, this was also useful in this uh, work on non-commutative rational lighting testing. So I won't go too much into it. OK. Yes. The previous comment about why permanent is a useful thing to have. Right. Normally, when you have a potential function to analyze an algorithm, you are sort of relying on it not being invariant. I mean, you want it to measure progress in some sense. Yeah, so it's invariant only up to a scalar. So that's why it's impo interest. Like, yeah, it's very convenient to track the progress because you just have to see what the scalar is. You just have to prove the scalar is at least one or something like that. It oh. keeps increasing. So just for convenience. It's, uh, I mean, convenience it, also, in some sense, is right. Yeah, uh, right thing to. I mean, yeah, we'll see that this. Yeah, this happens in a number of examples. I mean, also, yeah. I mean, one thing also is that sort of the convergence is characterized by permanent being greater than zero. So that also gives you some hint that whenever you will converge, you have the potential function is positive, and then sort of you can evolve. Okay. Yeah. 
So you, you, have, you want these two conditions and similarly, similar to here, you have these two operations that you can do to satisfy either of the two conditions. So one is one I'll call left normalization where you can multiply all the AIs on the left by this uh, weird looking term. So it's just the inverse square root of what you want to be identity. Okay. So if you do this, you can do a calculation. It will ensure that the one is satisfied. Okay. And similarly, sorry, this should be right. <clears throat> similarly, you can do this right normalization where you can multiply AIs on the right by the inverse square root of the other term that you want to be identity. And this will ensure that two is satisfied. Okay. And yeah, so Gurwitz in 2004, he suggested this algorithm. You can just alternatively keep doing right, left and right normalization. And yeah, so and he also proved that it, should, it converges whenever it should. So that, that is whenever there is a scaling of this form, whenever th there exists B and C such that these conditions are satisfied, you can find that them by sort of running this iterative algorithm. Why is there some invertible numbers? Sorry? You're multiplying by invertible matrices, right? The sum is invertible. Yeah, so this sum, uh, sum over I, AI, AI conjugate transpose, if it's not invertible, then uh, yeah, then there's no way of making these two identity by the scaling. Like, yeah, then it's not scalable. It's the bad set. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so Gurwitz proved it converges whenever it should, and he proved efficient convergence bound in special cases, okay? And in this uh, joint work with uh, Gurwitz, uh, uh, Leonid, Raphael, and Avi, uh, we proved that in n log n over epsilon iterations, you get epsilon close to satisfying this condition. So it's, I mean, yeah, you can see that it's exactly the same bound. And yeah, I mean, epsilon close to satisfying these conditions is something like this. You want that the, uh, the sum of this uh, outer product minus identity Frobenius norm square are small in both cases. So it's that. Okay, any questions? There's just one other setting. Okay, so let's look at a third setting. Something that we call tensor scaling. I, I am sorry. Sir. So, do you measure a distance in L2 here? It's Frobenius norm. Is there a correct norm to measure it? I mean, it's the same thing, right? L2 so norm. The so, it's always, the, always L2 is the right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, doesn't really but matter. Uh, might as well choose that. Yeah. It, doesn't it doesn't matter. Is there a right? Uh, but this is the right one in calculations, yeah. Okay, yeah, so this is something called tensor scaling, okay? So here the input is a ten, n by n by n tensor, okay? And sort of, you want these three conditions to be satisfied. So, okay, so you have a tensor, you can slice it up in three directions, okay? <coughs> you slice it up, and then you think of these matrices that you get as vectors, okay? So you form each of these you consider as a n square vector. And combining these n square vectors, you get n by n square matrices. Okay, so these are the three flattenings of the tensor. Okay, so the three n by n square matrix matrices you get by flattening the tensor. Okay, okay, so those are these empty uh, i, and then you sort of take the outer products of these. So rho t i, I'll say it's empty i, empty i conjugate transpose. Okay, so this is a n by n matrix. Okay, n by n positive definite matrix. Okay, clear up till so far. And yeah, I mean, if you're interested, so if if you think of T as a quantum state, then these are the quantum marginals of this quantum state. But yeah, it doesn't really matter for this purpose. And we, what we want in this setting is that all these marginals are identity, okay? So this, this is a setting which sort of uh, generalizes this setting in some way, okay? So you want this, that all these marginals are identity, okay? Questions? So yeah, I mean, this turns out to be the gradient equals zero condition for, uh, for for certain group action, basically the group action of GLN cross GLN cross GLN on tensors, okay? And yeah, is it useful? We don't know, but yeah, we can do this. We don't know if it's useful. Yeah, okay, so the question is clear. What do you want? Why are you allowed to do the tensor? Why? Why are you allowed to do the tensor? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I forgot to mention. Yeah, so, uh, should write somewhere? So, operations that you allowed is the group action that I mentioned. So operations, uh, group action of 
GLN cross GLN cross GLN. So you can change bases from all the three sides. That's what it is. Yeah, so I won't go uh, into explicitly what you have to do, but as in the previous settings, there's a way of satisfying one of the conditions. Okay? Basically, you do the normalization in this setting, basically do the, I mean, you want the slices to be orthogonal, that's what it means for this to be identity, and you can do this in this direction, this direction, that direction. Okay. So, so does this have any application for null cone membership for that action or anything? Else? Yeah, yeah. So be, because we are minimizing the norm square so thing. In that terminology, what is the result then? Yeah. So we don't really solve the null cone problem. Uh, so yeah. So let me mention the result, and then I'll say why we don't solve the null cone problem. Okay. So yeah. So the algorithm that uh, we sort of suggested in this joint work with Peter, uh, Raphael, Michael Walter, and Avi. Uh, and this algorithm was also suggested before in this paper of Wurtstra et al, that you just alternately normalize in all the three directions. So it's not a surprise by now, right? And that's the algorithm. And uh, I mean, yeah, this paper didn't prove even convergence for this algorithm. And uh, so yeah, in this joint work, we proved that in n log n over epsilon iterations, you get epsilon close to satisfying the conditions in the L2 sense, okay? So again, the bound is exactly the same. Yeah, so regarding the null cone problem, it turns out that to solve the null cone problem, you want uh, the algorithm to have a logarithmic dependence on 1 over epsilon. That's so what would solve the null cone problem? So if, 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 uh, if you had a bound like n, maybe poly n, and log 1 over epsilon, instead of 1 over epsilon. So if you had such an algorithm, that would solve the null cone problem. Oh, log of 1? Yes. So you're exponentially far. Yeah, in, in the epsilon parameter, we are exponentially far, yes. Okay, so any questions? So, yes. are these uh, convergence results tight? As in, do you know if these, uh, these algorithms perform just you know, n log n over epsilon? Yeah, I think they should be tight even in the matrix scaling case. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so let, let me, yeah, so let me say something about the analysis of this algorithm. Uh, so it turns out there's a unified way of an analyzing these algorithms using invariant theory. Okay. But I didn't get there. Also, you don't have log one over epsilon there, there on yeah. the second. So that's a good question. Uh, then how did you get that? Then? Yeah, somehow here you only needed the one over epsilon. Yeah, I mean we can talk offline. Like okay. somehow, I mean it's like in for linear programming, right? Some linear programs you can solve by this one over epsilon kind of algorithm. Uh, algorithms like if you have like matrix scaling or like bybird matching you don't need all this fancy machinery of linear programming but for general linear program you need this log on or epsilon so it's the same thing that's going on here it's just about the distance of your orbit closure from the point zero in the case it does not contain it in some cases it's just polynomially small and that's enough in some cases it's exponentially small and you need a much better yeah. uh, I mean yeah, it's not exactly the distance no that, distance, yeah. yeah. And so, and the reason really is that there is a whole condition for that case and there is no whole condition like for that, for this case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some this combinatorial, like a linear algebraic condition in this case, but not in this case. So, yes. so here, what is the criteria for convergence? Like the permanent, what is the analog like in the operating? Yeah, so we'll see, yeah. So there'll be invariants, okay? So yeah, so now I have to write something. So the framework for analyzing this algorithm is the following. So the, what will be the potential functions for analyzing? And as we saw in the matrix <coughs> case, it was the permanent, right? And in general, the potential functions will look like this. So you have your input V, and the potential function will be something like some invariant evaluated on V to the power one of D. So P is an invariant again up to a scalar uh, for the corresponding group action. Okay. And it's it's homogeneous of degree D. So 
I'm using V, like V in this case denotes A in the matrix scaling case, tuple of matrices in the operator scaling case, and tensor in the uh, tensor scaling case. Okay, so our potential functions will be you choose an invariant of homogeneous of degree D for the corresponding group action and just take one over dth power. Okay. So P is a polynomial. P is a polynomial. Invariant polynomial, sorry. Yeah, and given this potential function, there are three natural steps that you have to follow. You have to lower bound. So you want to prove that phi is at least L initially. And then there's a progress per step, which usually involves saying that you make progress as, far, as long as you're far uh, from uh, satisfying <laughs> the conditions. So you make progress whenever you can make progress. So normalization step increases this phi by a factor of e to the epsilon uh, if you are epsilon far from satisfying the conditions. What is L? So it's some lower bound you'll prove on your initial potential function. Something like, yeah, one over polyna polynomial in n. Yeah, maybe exponential in minus n or something. Epsilon from far from satisfying the conditions. Okay. So whenever you are epsilon from satisfying the conditions, your normalization will increase the potential function by a uh, e to the epsilon factor. And the upper bound is that you want that phi is upper bounded by some, there's an upper bound u and this is always satisfied. Okay. So initially you have the lower bound, phi is lower bounded by L, and normalization increases by a factor of e to the epsilon if you are epsilon far, and phi is always upper bounded by u, period, right? So then in log of u by L over epsilon iterations, you have to get epsilon close to satisfying the conditions, right? So that's the flavor of the analysis that goes into these things, okay? So can you say in what sense is P invariant? I mean, this is Ram Prasad's question again. Oh, yeah, but so. When you say on the one hand it's invariant, but at the same time it's growing. <laughs> right, okay, so yeah, so it's invariant up to the scalar, so let me write it for the. Think if the word is relative invariant. Yeah, so maybe I, let me write it. So let's say in the operator scaling case, you have this, you have m inputs and you act by b and c on both sides, then this will be equal to determinant of b times determinant of c to the power d over n, so d is a degree of p times p <coughs> a1 to a m. So in, it's invariant up to the determinants. But in general, it, it, you really have to think which group you are acting with, and it's whether you are acting with, the, let's say, the general linear group or the special linear group, or oh, with diagonal matrices arbitrary and versus diagonal matrices of the terminant one. Uh, this, this is the only difference. So it's, it is really an invariant if you impose the determinant one condition. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, which you are allowed, that's the algorithm allowed to do, you get exactly the progress. But do you have to choose that piece judiciously in the Yes, way? yeah, yeah. We have to the, choose the piece judicially. So yeah, so in these three steps, the second step is very automatic. Like it just, you just follow the recipe of LSW and follows, and it involves some robust version of AMG inequality. Okay, so it yeah, it really boils down to proving that these determinants are at least one, uh, or at least e to the epsilon, and this just follows uh, syntactically. Uh, I mean, this just follows from these epsilon far conditions uh, using some robust version of AMG. Okay, so this is really automatic and exactly the same in all the all these papers. Okay, okay. so yes. maybe. Just to see if I'm making a mistake. So this notion of using this sort of invariant under this sense is just so that you can sort of measure progress just by how far you were from your target and not about what point you are. I mean, you don't want this to really depend on A1 through AM. Yeah, exactly. But you want it to just depend on how far you were from your target. Yeah. Okay. So it turns out that's, yeah, that, that's what these do. Okay, yeah, so yeah, so, so this step is really automatic and not so hard and just you do the LSW thing. And <coughs> lower bound and upper bound, you need to uh, pick this invariance judiciously, as Ketan said. And sort of here we need uh, some help from invariant theory. So basically what we need, 
write this one in the null end. So what you need are that there exists invariants with uh, not too large coefficients, uh, not too large integer coefficients. Okay. And degree also. Yeah. So it turns out in these cases degree doesn't matter. Like the degree term just cancels out miraculously. But in general you would need exponential degree bounds also. But in these cases you do, don't need. Okay. So you need uh, coefficient bounds for invariants. So let me just state a formal thing for the tensor case. <coughs> so for tensors, this is a theorem which we prove in BG, W. But yeah, I mean, this is basically relying heavily on the past invariant theory uh, theorems. So there exists a basis of degree D invariants. Again, invariants in this relative sense, such that uh, so I mean, so degree d invariants form a vector space, and there exists a basis of this vector space such that all basis polynomials have integer coefficients. Okay, and more importantly, the coefficients are not too large. So I'll write it in terms of this. Uh, uh, condition that we actually need in the analysis. So when you evaluate p on any vector v, this is at most, uh, uh, like put the 1 over dth power, this is at most n cube times the L2 norm of the vector v for all polynomials in the basis. So the coefficients are not too large. Okay? This is what you need from the invariant. Uh, Does this from come invariant. from omega process or something like that? So omega process, yeah. So yeah, so yeah, I'll say that. Uh, this exactly doesn't come from the omega process. So yeah, so, so yeah, well, is this theorem non-trivial or not? And in terms of this theorem is exactly uh, highly non-trivial. So there, there are some trivial bounds you can get here. Okay, so <coughs> you can reduce uh, finding invariants to solving systems of linear equations, and the bounds you'll get will be typically exp doubly exponential indeed. Okay, so you'll get very bad bounds if you do this naively. But yeah, it just turns out miraculously that people have highly non-explicit constructions of invariants in this case. But since we only need some weak guarantees on these polynomials, you can just read off this theorem from those constructions. Okay? And in general, they're also, uh, they have also these processes to generate the invariants, and one is Scaly's Omega process, as Ketan said, and those will also give some bounds here. They will, they will be worse, but they will still guarantee polynomial okay, number of iterations. Sir. Yes. Okay. Can we write down explicitly any of these invariants? So in the in the operator scaling case, matrix scaling case, you can, but not here. I mean, you can write them down, but yeah, it's it's a messy expression. All you can read is the coefficient bounds that what we wanted. But yeah, in the tensor case, we don't know the invariants. I think one can write it down, but uh, that involves some permutation. So we know the structure. So we know the structure. Okay, so I'll end here. Thank you. Yeah, so in, in some settings, like in matrix scaling, there are several algorithms getting log 1 over epsilon. In the operator scaling case, also, we have some algorithms getting log 1 over epsilon. But not in the tensor case, we don't have them yet. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, Nikit. Yes. Uh, is there a hope here to do like this? So you, you, you also can define capacity in this case. Yeah, you can define capacity, yeah. Yeah. And, and we were lucky to prove without uh, the capacity, the bounds on the capacity, without actually invariance theory. No, we use invariant theory heavily. We use the characterization of the invariants. No, there, there is a bound which uses only Hilbert theory. Existence. You only need but you also needed the structure of the invariants, right? We, we use the structure of the invariants to prove yes, coefficient yeah, bounds. Yeah. You, so you know the structure. Yeah. So uh, and you, you prove pretty much using. So and here here you can get to the bound on the capacity in this way. Yeah, you can. Yeah, so that's turns out of the same analysis. You can use capacity also, but yeah, you need coefficient bounds for invariants. Okay.